Good morning. Hopefully it's morning where you are. Uh, uh, this is Bill Stone with True Tech Tools, and I would like you to um, to welcome you to another edition of True Tech Training. Um, Jim Bergman is going to be presenting on behalf of AccuTools. He's going to be discussing the Blue Flame Combustion Analyzer, but also a lot of other topics related to combustion analysis, and especially this great quick start guide he's developed, uh, which you can get from going through the AccuTools website. I'm sure Jim will talk about that and show you a link for that at the appropriate time. So I am going to turn it over to Jim right now. Jim, how you doing? Good, good. Everything's going well. Okay, so, so I'm going to make you the presenter. All right. All right, show my Got the screen. controls. Great, looks fantastic. All right, good. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. So this is Jim Bergman. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go through a little bit of uh, overview of combustion analysis and um, more or less featuring a blue flame analyzer. It's a new product for AccuTools. Um, and we're just going to go through, uh, it's really not too much of a sales pitch. Sorry about that in advance. It's more of a training course, but uh, it'll give you a good idea of what we can do with uh, with a combustion analyzer and uh, what, what we should be looking for. The uh, Let me get my slides to go in here. Here we go. A lot of people don't think about the versatility of a combustion analyzer and what it can do. And, and they, they think it's just a, a one-shot wonder. It just measures combustion. And uh, it does so much more. And it's really almost the only tool that you need to set up a furnace properly. Because you can do your, your ambient CO testing, your incoming gas pressure, your manifold pressure, temperature rise, total external static pressure, pressure drop testing across filters and coils. Um, you can do all your combustion testing of a furnace, hot water tank, stoves, ovens, dryers, draft testing, CAS testing, and, and you know, and other things. I mean, this is a tool that does, um, it's not just a single simple instrument. It, it does uh, way more than most people realize. And it's got some really, really high end sensor technology when it comes to temperature and pressure. And uh, it's, it makes the uh, setting up of a furnace just just much much easier. Um, the first thing when you when you when you're using a combustion analyzer that you really want to use it for is ambient CO testing, and ambient CO should be uh, checked and recorded with a combustion analyzer, and it should be monitored as you go on. And um, typical alarm hey, level. Jim, yes, sir. Interrupt you with the slides aren't changing um, as far as I can tell. Oh, they're changing on my end. Interesting. Let me hit escape here. Oh, you know what? It says it's paused. Show my screen. Okay, now I see ambient CO. Okay. All right. So let me uh, just restart this. And uh, you good now? That looks great. All right. All right. Ambient CO testing. For some reason, Bill. Okay. Did it just switch slides? Are we good? You're good, switch slides. Okay, all right. So ambient CO testing, it should be checked with your combustion analyzer, and um, but you should also continually monitor your ambient CO. And we recommend that you get an ambient CO monitor, Testo, Mercurio, Sensit, uh, one you, you know, can connect to your coat, uh, carry in your pocket, and it's just continually monitoring the CO while you're testing and when you're walking into, um, in, into the combustion air zone. Uh, I was just watching a video just the other day, a uh, guy walking into a uh, kitchen, and um, the CO levels were over 100 parts per million in the kitchen. As he was walking in, he was using a, a, a fluke um, CO tester. And uh, you just never know what you're going to walk into, and, and you never know what's going to change while you're doing the testing itself. Because you got to remember, testing, you're in a dynamic environment. Things are always changing. You're, you're running and stopping fans. You're turning on and off burners. There's other you know, burners in a room, maybe a hot water tank or a dryer or, you know, in a boiler room, there could be other boilers. And just because what you're working on isn't uh, contaminating the environment doesn't mean something else locally can't be. So you should always monitor your CO level and, and we highly recommend you carry a, a, uh, an ambient CO meter. When you use this, you, you step outside and here's just a picture. I grabbed a couple snapshots off a video I did earlier and um, I'm just outside, you know, uh, getting fresh air getting a, a zero point for the combustion analyzer so I know um, where to start, you know, that I have a fresh air to start sampling with. And uh, that's really important. Then when you go in, inside, uh, you want to hold that probe about chest level. And we're going to just walk through and test on each floor and make sure that um, that we don't have CO in the living space and we don't have CO in the combustion air zone while we're working. 
And it's just a, a real simple test. It takes one or two minutes, but it allows us just to make sure that there's you know, no CO in the home. Carbon monoxide, you gotta remember it's odorless, colorless, tasteless. You, you really don't know it's in the air. Um, sometimes if you're lucky, you'll, you'll smell some, uh, some aldehydes of gas burning, you know, the unburned gases, but the CO itself doesn't have any smell and CO is poisonous. So, um, and, and high levels of exposure can really be bad for you. You just gotta watch that. Um, customers or yourself, if you're exposed to CO, you know, usually uh, sometimes you get like an immediate headache or uh, dizziness, blurred vision, nausea, fatigue or drowsiness, shortness of breath. Uh, those are all indicators of um, CO poisoning or, or, you know, sometimes just uh, somebody, they feel better when they, uh, when they're at uh, work, but, you know, or feel better at home, you know, wherever they're at most of the time. And then, you know, they get sick when they enter an environment. That's uh, times we want to check for CO. And really, um, a combustion analyzer should be used year round for this. This is something, you know, we, we talk about these sensors, they're chemical sensors. They're wearing out whether you use them or not. And you should uh, be testing for CO annually, year round, uh, summer, winter. You know, you still have combustion appliances, hot water tanks, dryers burning in the house. Um, and you want to test for that CO year round on there. And it should be part of your regular ins inspection. There are uh, health levels and exposure levels for CO. And, um, you know, typically uh, zero to nine parts per million, uh, we consider a normal baseline level of CO in a home. Uh, I typically don't like to see it over zero in my own house because I know that, um, you know, about the only thing in my house that puts off a little CO is my oven when it's running for a long time. So on Thanksgiving, I might get two or three parts per million in my house when it's running all day. But aside from that, I, I know my baseline CO pretty much runs zero parts per million. And then, you know, when you get into uh, you know, different ranges, there's different calls to action. Those are listed in the combustion guide in there, but pretty much, you know, if you walk into a space and it's uh, encroaching 75 parts per million, you probably should get the occupants out. And that's usually where we say, you know, that's a stop work point. We want to ventilate the space in there. Um, it's just not safe to work when you get over 75 parts per million in there. And, uh, and you know, that's a good, a good stopping point on there. And you can see, Obviously, if the level gets really high in there, uh, you can get very nauseous very fast and it could even lead to death. So that's the, the CO thing, but um, you know, don't forget there's other possible sources, uh, hot water tanks, fireplaces, cars in the garage. Uh, more than anything, uh, auto emissions, people starting a car in the garage to get it warmed up is a big uh, producer of CO. But we also see things like, um, uh, I've seen, uh, uh, Ornamental fireplaces uh, put off large amounts of CO. Tobacco smoke can do it also, space heaters. So just be aware that uh, don't get that furnace fixation where you think everything could be fixed at the furnace because there are other sources of CO that you have to be uh, aware of. So the next thing a combustion analyzer can be used for is uh, draft testing and spillage testing. And um, here I am, uh, you know, checking a furnace. I'm doing actually doing the draft setting on the on a 90 plus and really what we're doing is just monitoring the pressure in the in the exhaust pipe to make sure that it's not excessive indicating a blockage of the exhaust pipe but you also have to have enough pressure that the flue gases can actually exit uh, fully um, very very important to look at the manual uh, of the furnace and make sure that that vent pipe was installed properly bill spone and i were on a uh, expert witness case years ago where an exhaust accelerator was not installed on the flue pipe. An exhaust accelerator means that you have a, a basically a large pipe going out, uh, like that three inch pipe I have shown there, but then it reduces down before it goes out to a, uh, like say a two inch pipe. And what that's for is to eliminate friction in the pipe. The large pipe eliminates the friction or lowers the friction rate. And then, but we need to neck it down before it goes out to push the exhaust gases far away from the house. And the, the job we were on, they actually had uh, an overhang for a, a ornamental fireplace, and it was uh, a, a pathway for CO to come back in the home because it was just sitting there right next to the house instead of exhausting out, causing exhaust gas recirculation problems. So uh, again, um, a good use for the combustion analyzer. Now, typically when we measure draft, what we're talking about is a draft hood. And um, it, a draft hood is really, really cool. It's sort of a, a lost technology. And you don't think about it much anymore. And people go, oh, well, the draft hood's obsolete. You know, we don't see them. But you walk down and look at any hot water tank in a basement, and 99% uh, of them have draft hoods on them. We still see a ton of them in the industry. And there's still a lot of older appliances out there that have draft hoods. So they're, they're really worth talking about. 
And the function of a draft hood is to separate the appliance from the draft. It physically, and when you're looking here um, where this draft hood is at, you know, you got the top of the flue coming off and then you got this open space and it physically separates the appliance from the draft. And what happens here is, um, you know, as the, as, a, as the fuel's burning, the, the hot flue gases rise up and they rise up at a, at a perfect rate, right? Because they designed the combustion chamber in there to uh, control the velocity of the, of the flue gases going up to the furnace. So this is an engineered solution. And as this goes up, what happens is, you know, it goes up and through the draft hood and, and we bring in secondary air right behind it. And the secondary air gets drawn in. It's just, uh, it's, it's um, basically the Bernoulli effect. You know, as we're, if we're, we're exhausting air out, we're pulling air, fresh air in behind it. And that's our secondary air for our burner. All of our primary air enters in through the uh, enters in through the uh, uh, through the burn to throat itself, right through the Venturi effect, and that draft hood's job is to physically separate the appliance from the draft, so that if that draft hood were to become blocked, like here I got a bird in the chimney, if that were to become blocked, what would happen is the flue gases would just spill into the space. Now. You might think, oh boy, that's really that's something to be concerned with. But if it, if an appliance is burning properly, all it does is produce carbon dioxide, water vapor, and heat. And the typical reason we exhaust an appliance outside is because um, we 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 don't want to take a chance of exposing anybody to carbon monoxide. And we also uh, there's a huge amount of water that's produced by combustion gases that would be hard for the home to handle. So it's really important that we exhaust those things outside. But the the physical separation of the draft hood is designed so that if we if we block the flue, the flames don't come out the front of the boiler and uh, or the front of the furnace in this case. Uh, you've got to be very very careful for that. The draft hood was designed to prevent fires. And when you had the when you had the appliance um, connected directly to the draft without a draft hood, it also um, made the appliance operate erratically as the draft uh, increased or decreased. The amount of secondary air entering the burner would change and uh, the draft hood was a way of simply eliminating all of those issues. And it also prevented things like downdrafts and, and nuisance pilot outages. Now, what we have to be careful of is that if we don't have good combustion, then we're gonna get carbon dioxide, water vapor, heat, and carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is poisonous gas. And again, that's the reason we always check uh, around the draft hood for spillage and make sure that all the flue gases are going up into the uh, into the hood and exhausting outside. Now we do the same thing. Um, you know, when we're testing this, a couple of important notes are: draft doesn't always occur immediately because chimneys can be cold. And if you've ever lit in a, a fireplace, you know that sometimes you have to um, you know start a little piece of newspaper on fire and get the draft going. And so uh, we do have standards for draft. It must be established within five minutes of starting the appliance. It allows the chimney a little time to get warmed up. And then we're going to check for spillage across the entire length uh, or circumference of the draft hood. And we'll use a smoke pencil or wind indicator. In this case here, that little serious wind indicator it just makes a little puff of um, uh, a puff of gas or puff of smoke that we can see. And what we're looking for is just um, you know all that to get sucked into the draft hood. And you know, a good sign of um, a draft hood that's not bending properly is rust or staining on the outside of the hood. Um, you know, that's good evidence of spillage. And so th those are the things that we wanna, we wanna look for on there. Um, but again, you, uh, you draft test uh, above the draft diverter, and then I'll show you when we do combustion testing here in a little bit uh, further on. But spillage is a result of typically a downdraft. That's what I'm showing here with this arrow here, is a downdraft. Uh, on the appliance creates spillage, and well, obviously well, we want to minimize that at all costs. Hot water tanks, exactly the same thing. Um, we want to, you know, draft within five minutes, check for spillage across the circumference or uh, around the entire hood, smoke pencil or, or wind indicator again. And uh, one big difference on, on hot water tanks is um, right where the connectors are, a lot of times you'll see those melted plastic rings where the water lines uh, connect. It's a very good indicator the hot water tank is not spilling. And what you'll see a lot of times is where the larger appliance will actually spill out the smaller appliance uh, on the on a hot water tank. So in this case here, I've got a I've got a furnace, I've got a blockage here, and, uh, and a lot of times this happens more on induced drafts. Probably should throw an 80 plus furnace in here, but the the flue gases go up and then they exhaust out of the draft hood of the smaller appliance, and the spillage is there. 
so people will check these appliances and they'll they'll think everything's working fine and and it looks like um, everything's working well, but they're actually dumping all the food gases uh, for the uh, for the large appliance out the draft hood on the smaller appliance. And it, it's so critical that when that furnace is running, you walk over to that hot water tank if they're common vented and you make sure that you're not uh, venting out that hood. Vent connect connectors and chimneys should always be inspected. Here's a, um, a shot of a, uh, down here on the lower left, of a chimney liner, and uh, the acids and the flue gases were condensing, and it literally uh, rotted that liner out. And when we pulled the chimney apart, you know, we pulled the, the vent connector off up here and looked inside there, there's a pile of aluminum uh, powder inside of the uh, chimney, and the whole liner had just uh, literally rotted away inside there. So. We do need to check, you know, vent connectors should be pulled off and you should test those things and then, you know, test the draft with your combustion analyzer. Manifold pressure. This is an interesting one because there's there's been some controversy over the years and I want to I want to clear this all up today. And, um, you know, let's talk about that for just a minute because there's really only two things we can do on a furnace to get it set up properly. And that's set the input, which which means typically setting the manifold pressure, the fuel input, and then setting the temperature rise. And setting the input is by far the most important uh, aspect, uh, aside from temperature rise, of setting up the furnace because um, we need to have the correct fuel and air mixture. This is These appliances are engineered. And as the appliances are getting to higher and higher efficiencies, as we're getting into that 95, 96, 97% efficient range, the amount of fuel and air uh, becomes more and more critical and we have to get that fuel and air ratio correct. And the way that we do that is we get the input correct on the appliance. And um, you know, typically when we talk about you know, how much air is required, well, for one cubic foot of natural gas, it requires 10 cubic foot of air for complete combustion, and an additional five cubic foot of excess air for safe combustion. So we always mix in a little bit more air than we need because um, we, we want to make sure that every gas molecule contacts an air molecule so we get a complete combustion of the flue gases. So it, it is completely normal for a combustion process to produce zero parts a million CO, completely normal. And you'll see that all the time uh, if you have a quality analyzer that has a NOx filter in there like the blue flame does. Now, the, the excess air we want to carefully control in there so we don't want any more air than we need because all that air does, it goes in, and it goes out and it really doesn't provide any function except for safety, but it robs the flue gases of their heat energy and it robs the appliance of its efficiency. So if we don't have that input correct, then what happens is we don't get the maximum efficiency out of the appliance. If you have a dilution air hood or draft hood, uh, you're gonna require an additional 15 cubic foot of air per cubic foot of gas. And think about this draft hood for a minute because it runs year round it's constantly exhausting air out of the home. So these are what we call standby losses. And, uh, and standby losses, so you might get like an, an 80 plus of efficient furnace and, a, and a, what we would consider classically a 70% furnace sitting side by side, both running exactly the same combustion efficiency, both running 80% combustion efficiency, but the older furnace, because it has a pilot, it has about a 10% loss, because it has a draft hood, it has another 10% loss. So that, that appliance is, really operating about 60% efficient AFUE compared to the 80% AFUE um, uh, furnace in the basement. So you gotta also remember that uh, combustion efficiency and AFUE are two different things. AFUE accounts for uh, standby losses in there. Now, part of the reason that uh, setting fuel pressure correctly is so important is called the Wobeck index. And it's just a, a measure of the interchangeability of fuel gases and their ability to deliver energy. And I just grabbed this, this is from the uh, EIA, it's the heat content of natural gas consumed and it's you know by state and by year. And you can see here that um, you, know, you have heat content 1036, 989 in Alaska, you have uh, you know, 1056 in Iowa and it goes up probably to 1070, you see a 1065 there. The heat content of gas varies all over the country. And so when we're setting a furnace up, we have to account for that. And we do that by getting the manifold pressure correct. And a lot of guys, they're always like, oh, you gotta set it to exactly uh, 3.5 inches of water column. Well, that is a nominal fuel pressure, okay? So it's a nominal fuel pressure, which means the standard fuel pressure that the system's designed with. And that means it's, it's designed 
for that gas pressure at a certain heat content of fuel, uh, which we don't typically know what the heat content is from the manufacturer. A lot of times it's a higher heat content, like 1070 BTUs. Um, but without clocking a meter, we just don't know. Now, there is an allowable range of adjustment of the fuel pressure. It's typically plus or minus 10%. And if you go in carriers' uh, manuals and you look at um, you know, converting a furnace from LP to natural gas, you'll see that they allow you to adjust the fuel pressure from 3.2 to 3.8. And this is common for all manufacturers. Um, and But you, you don't want to go above 3.8 because higher settings can cause flame impingement along with lower settings because the, the pressure is what really defines the shape of the flame, right? And if, if you've ever lit a torch before, you know that as you increase or decrease the fuel pressure on a torch, you see the flame change in there. And because the, the, the heat exchanger is engineered around the design of the flame, you have to be really, really careful about how you... Uh, you know, the range that you set that in, but 3.2 to 3.8 is very, very uh, common. If you, you also have to watch because if, if you get that fuel pressure too low, it can actually cause high CO and that could be either from impingement or it can be from uh, what we call uh, air quenching, which means we're, we're just providing so much excess air to the fuel that it's cooling off the flame and it's not producing, uh, you know, not converting all this, the uh, carbon into fuel to carbon dioxide. So again, uh, really, really important on there. And this is a great use for a combustion analyzer. Um, you know, it's got a built-in differential manometer in there and it reads in uh, thousands of an inch of water column. So here I'm setting the fuel pressure, adjusting the burner on there until I get that fuel pressure to exactly the right uh, fuel pressure on the burner. A clock in a meter is literally what it means. And here I'm showing going outside and I'm physically clocking a meter. I'm using an iPhone to do that out there. And what we're doing is we're counting the amount of uh, time it takes for a meter to actually do a full revolution. And, and this is really important. And your gas meter is actually a very, very accurate uh, measure of the, um, uh, of the cubic feet of gas because it's a revenue grade meter. You're, you're paying a utility bill on these things. They have to be set up right so we get the right amount of, um, the, the right amount of gas we're paying for, right? You wouldn't, uh, that's, that's the job of that meter. So you can rely on that. It's a very accurate um, count of, of uh, of gas. When we clock the meter, there's some important things I want you to realize on this thing. Number one, uh, down at the bottom, this is a shot off the combustion guide. All these gas tables that you see are based upon a heat content of gas, and it's typically a thousand BTUs per cubic foot. So when you clock that meter, you have to make some corrections. I'll show you how we do that in there to make sure that you're getting your heat content of gas right. Because again, getting that heat content, getting that input correct, is one of the most important things that you can do when you set up an appliance. In fact, um, uh, probably 10 years ago, I went to CSA Labs in uh, Canada, and we were, or not Canada, in Cleveland, excuse me, uh, it's Canadian gas now, it used to be the old AGA Labs in Cleveland. The very first thing they did when they, when they bought, brought these furnaces in was they pulled the orifices out and they resized the orifices for the heat content of gas in Ohio, and uh, and that was so they could do the testing on the furnace to make sure it didn't produce carbon monoxide, to make sure the heat input was correct, the output was correct, the ratings were correct, because everything we do on that furnace is based upon getting correct input to that burner. And so it can't be um, uh, understated how important that is. So when I clock the meter here, um, this is in case 48 seconds, and so you look down, you follow that down till you're at the 48 second mark on there, and you have to pay attention to what dial that you clocked on there. In this case, it's a one cubic foot dial that we were using. So um, I'm going to select at 48 seconds, 75,000 BTUs of input. And that's that's our input setting. But now that that's 75,000 BTUs and at a um, at a uh, uh, at a thousand BTUs of gas. So in, in this case, uh, and this is, sorry, I changed my example here, but um, this was out of the video. In this case here, uh, we, we're at 86,000 BTUs of input, but the supplier chart was a 1025. My chart, the chart you guys are looking at was a thousand. So we have a multiplier of 1.025. And simply all you do then is just correct it. So because the heat content's higher from the supplier, it's actually 102%, all right, 102.5% of, uh, of, the, of the input on the chart. So all we do is multiply that out and we get 88,150. Hey, Jim. Now, yes, sir. 
I got one question that came in. How do you clock the meter with liquid propane? So with liquid propane, what you would do is you buy what's called a sublet meter. And uh, a sublet meter, you can, you can buy um, gas meters for apartments and you would just uh, uh, install the meter in line temporarily in the basement while you're doing your uh, input tests on there. And um, you have to get a meter that's calibrated for propane and it'll be calibrated for a certain inlet pressure of propane, typically 10 inches uh, of water column of input, 10, 10 to 13. It'll tell you on the meter, and then you would just uh, connect the meter in line, clock the meter, get the input correct, and then you just pull the meter back out again, uh, out of the um, out of the out of the circuit. And um, that's the easiest way to do that. Propane is a little bit more challenging than other than other fuel gases are, simply because um, they don't have a meter uh, typically attached. But that's uh, the way that uh, I've done it in the past when I've had to do that. So for years. I went outside and um, I would I, I would clock the meter and then I'd go out and tweak my gas pressure up and go back out and reclock it and then go back in and recheck it and it was going back and forth. And a part of the reason I never adjusted gas pressure when I was first starting as a technician because it was a pain. And I, I had no idea that there was actually a formula that if I know what my current gas pressure is and my current manifold pressure is that I could calculate out based upon my required input what my what my new gas pressure would be. So this is the formula, it's just Q2, uh, it's, the, it's the quantity that we desire equals the quantity that we have times the, uh, the uh, square root of the uh, pressure that uh, the new manifold pressure divided by the old. So we gotta do a little algebra to rearrange this thing and I'll show you what I did here. And in this case, um, my desired output's 90,000 BTUs. So 90,000 equals 88,150, which is what I clocked my meter at. Uh, divided uh, multiply times the square root of P2 over 3.5. You do a little algebra, re rearrange all those equations, and you end up with um, 90,000 divided by 88,150 squared times 3.5 inches, and it gives us 3.65 inches of water column. So I can calculate out, based upon what my known input is, exactly what I need to set that meter for. And as long as I'm in that 3.2 to 3.8 range, I'm totally totally fine on there. To, that's an allowable range of adjustment on there, and that will get my input at exactly 90,000 BTUs of input. Now, you could wait uh, for a couple of days because in, um, in a couple of days, we're gonna be releasing a new version of MeasureQuick that actually works with the Blue Flame Analyzer and does all the calculations. And, and I just got three screenshots up here that I was doing some, uh, just some testing. And what it shows us here is when we need to downsize the orifice or upsize the orifice or when the orifice is in the correct range, but we just need to adjust the manifold pressure. And it allows you to put in the heat content of gas for your area and allows you to do the, um, you know, select your fuel type and your meter revolutions and it'll calculate all those things for you. So as you clock the meter, it'll exact show you exactly where you need to set your, your target manifold pressure so you don't have to do all this math. And that'll be, you know, in the Measure Quick app, um, and it'll tie in with a with a blue flame analyzer. So just um, uh, this will be out in about a week here. I just thought you guys might like to see this uh, as we're doing some work getting that rolling. So let's talk about combustion testing because that's really the the heart of what the combustion analyzer does. And you know, let's at a you'll you'll see this, and I just want to make sure you understand what we're trying to do here. So when you look at a stoichiometric um, combustion. Uh, table, what you're looking at here is we're trying to get in this range of highest efficiency. You'll notice that um, down at the bottom, there's excess fuel and there's excess air. And a stoichiometric line is this line, this black line going right up the middle, which means that there, that we have a, the exact amount of fuel, we have the exact amount of air, and uh, that would be perfect combustion. That's where explosions happen, right? That's where, um, where the exact amount of fuel air mixture is, is there. And that means all the all the fuels consumed, all the oxygens consumed, and uh, stoichiometric combustion in the field is typically never achieved. We want to make sure that we're in the highest efficiency range here, which is in we always have some excess air. And the reason we need to be in there is because when a gas enters a burner, it it mixes and churns, but it doesn't all contact an oxygen molecule, and so we have to provide this excess air so we make sure that all the fuels consumed in there. We're trying to get the minimum amount of carbon monoxide, which means um, the carbon that doesn't convert fully to carbon uh, dioxide in there. And we don't want to have any excess fuel come through uh, on the 
you know, unburned fuel come through. So we're always providing the, the, uh, with the burner with some excess air. When you look at ideal combustion, you have, you know, methane plus oxygen equals heat, and that gives you your carbon dioxide, uh, two parts of water and one part of O2. And when we look at uh, typical combustion, we end up with uh, some CO in there. Now, if you have enough excess air and the burner's burning well, you, you, you likely will get no CO in the flue gases, but many, many burners produce a small amount of CO uh, in the flue gases. And, and no matter what you do, sometimes you just, you know, you have to resign yourself to the fact that there's gonna be a small amount of CO produced. But if you get that input correct, I will guarantee you that you will see fewer CO problems than you will see at any other time in your career because most of the time uh, when we have combustion issues, they're related to input of the appliance. It's 99% uh, of the time, once you get the input corrected, the appliance will settle right down and it'll operate with very, very low CO levels. What we're trying to do when, we, when we're doing combustion testing is make sure that we have safe, stable combustion. And this is an example, this is a graph off of a Tesla analyzer. And um, you can see that, you know, the CO, when it first lit off, this green line down here, it lit off, it had about a little over 100 parts per million of CO, but then that CO dropped right down to zero, right? So a little light off CO in a gas appliance is normal. If you look at the blue line, that's your oxygen. When the oxygen started, it was about 21% oxygen, and the oxygen level dropped down. Now, there's a little dip here in the O2 because we had excess fuel, and when it first lit off, and then it, you know, as, a, as the O2 level came up and stabilized here, you see the oxygen stable. And then we watch this run till our stack temperature starts to stabilize. Now, we talk about sometimes steady state efficiency on there, and, and notice that the stack temperature continues to rise the entire time on there. This is a, a 10 minute test. That is completely normal because the, the furnace is um, getting cooled down by the return air, and as the return air temperature increases, the stack temperature increases, they go hand in hand. So you'll never see your stack temperatures flatline out there, it's just doesn't, not something that typically happens. And then obviously you can see our efficiency stabilized there at uh, around 80% combustion efficiency on the appliance. This is a typical 80 plus furnace, and this is the kind of a combustion that we would expect to see. Now, what we don't want to see is something like this. And uh, this was a, uh, a boiler that was in uh, AMHA housing development. I got called out to to help um, troubleshoot. And this, you can see the O2 is all over the place on this. And it was getting, this is actually a steel combustion appliance that was getting impacted by changes of pressure in the combustion air zone. And you can see there that uh, the CO was running zero for quite some time, but then all of a sudden went up to over 3,500 parts per million CO and diluted. And it happened when the O2 level down here went from around 10% down to about 8% oxygen. And for whatever reason, it just completely impacted that burner and went to really, really high levels of CO. Now, when I saw that, I pulled the probe out, and that's why we have this huge drop in efficiency down here. That's the second part of this, because I didn't know how, how high that CO was going to go up. I didn't want to damage the combustion analyzer, so I pulled the probe out of the stack. And uh, But this is classic um, combustion air zone problems, depressurization problems. This was actually caused by a uh, remodel that was going on where they had an elevator that was um, acting like a giant plunger. And what you're actually seeing here in these O2 changes was the elevator going up and down stories. So when it would go up, it would suck the air out of the um, it would suck the air out of the uh, out of the out of the uh, boiler room. When it go back down a floor, it would push air back down in. And when it went, then here's where it went up on uh, on about minute six here. It went up several floors and it dropped the pressure down the boiler room significantly, and it caused combustion problems on the appliance. And you can see that uh, it also affected the stack temperature. The stack temperature was really erratic. And and when you see erratic combustion readings on your analyzer, that's a telltale sign that there's some serious problems going on in the room that you need to you need to be aware of. And again, another great use for the uh, for the combustion analyzer. Um, the measure quick version of this, I know some of you guys have seen the um, uh, you've seen the uh, blue flame analyzer and the blue flame app. The measure quick version of this is on the way, and uh, it's gonna. And you can see here we got the report. Um, we're just going through doing the final debugging and troubleshooting on here, but we're trying to make it very visual in nature. So this is like your CO air free. The two more, most important things we want to look when we're buying a combustion analyzer, we're trying to make sure that we have uh, safety, that the appliance is safe, and that the appliance is efficient, right? We're using it to make sure that it's safely operating at its highest level of efficiency. So, you know, we're doing things here with a manifold pressure. We'll be able to adjust the manifold pressure and see the input 
uh, automatically come up as we go. Show you the required manifold pressure to get the uh, related uh, the, the required input. It's going to show you very definitively if you're in the correct CO air free range or if your CO has gotten too high. Shows you what your you know the CO is a poisonous gas here. This is your combustion triangle uh, showing you gas, fuel, and, and heat energy, and it just shows you you know very visually um, if that appliance is running safely on there. So that'll be coming out here in the next uh, week or so. So we're wrapping that up right now. So let's talk about specifically about uh, gas furnaces and um, each one that you're going to run across. There's still a ton of 70% efficient appliances out there. And again, um, these appliances, they really aren't 70% efficient. They're actually a lot less than that because of all the standby losses on there. And you'll notice that they're going to run combustion efficiencies in the 80% range. And it's really, really important that when you test these appliances that you test in each cell. So you're going to put your analyzer up underneath the um, draft hood. In this case here, we have three burners, so we're going to do three combustion tests. We're going to test cell one, two, and three, and we're going to make sure that each cell individually is not producing um, flue gases that are outside of the uh, typical appliance combustion test results we want to see over here. So this blue box here is our draft hood, and that's what separates the draft from the appliance, and we're going to test in each combustion chamber and then we'll draft test uh, about a foot, 18 inches above the, um, the draft hood to make sure that we have adequate draft in there. And down here, I cannot stress this enough. Um, Bill and I ran across this in that CO poisoning case we did a couple years ago where the base pan on the furnace was not sealed. A lot of furnaces, uh, they don't always use bottom returns. They'll use a side return like we have shown here. And there's a base pan that is, can be cut out and sometimes they warp and they lift and that needs to be taped and masked down so that it, it doesn't leak. Um, and so when you're installing a new furnace, make sure that if, if, that, uh, if that base pan is, um, is not you know, cut out and used as a bottom return that you make sure that's sealed up there and make sure that's screwed down because that is a pathway uh, right at the blower to pull combustion gases back down there. On these appliances, we typically want to see excess air in the range of uh, 31 to 91 percent. That's pretty typical on there. They can go as low as 25 percent excess air, but again, these are typical ranges. We built the combustion gas guide out here. I want to I want to make sure you understand these are not definitive ranges. Uh, we didn't engineer every piece of equipment out there. I'm telling you, these are typical ranges we see for these types of appliances. So they could be a little higher. They could be a little lower. But if you get your input correct, this is typically the range you're going to see is in the 31 to 91 percent range on there. The the temperature rise range will be in that 40 to 100 degree rise. So these appliances typically run a higher temperature rise. That was one of the, the really nice things about these appliances was they really delivered hot heat on there. And then you know the draft around negative 0.02 to negative 0.04 um, is what we want to see the draft on there. We want to make sure we have enough draft pressure to pull the combustion gases out. And get them exhausted out of the uh, out of the house. Combustion efficiency is going to be in that 75 to 84 uh, percent range. And the the key thing here is the CO air free should be below 100 parts per million. Now, CO below 100 parts per million is typically always attainable if you get the uh, if you get the input right. And a lot of times that'll be almost down at zero. And I've seen these old appliances operate better than new appliances. Um, but uh, there there are allowable um, carbon dioxide air-free ranges of 400 parts per million in a flue gas. So, um, you know, you, you, you can run higher than 100. Uh, we don't typically recommend it, but it's not a cause. Uh, if you were to talk to a manufacturer, they would tell you that 400 is the allowable, uh, it's the ANSI standard, it's allowable, and that's also what we have in the combustion guide on there. I'm going to get into an 80%, right? Well, oh, excuse me, uh, a couple other things I wanted to cover here. When you're looking at that, you know, you're standing down there with a, with a customer and they're watching over your shoulder and they're saying, wow, my furnace is 81% combustion efficient. Well, you, you have to understand that there's combustion efficiency and there's AFU efficiency. And again, uh, when you take that combustion efficiency, now you need to explain to your customer, well, we need to subtract 10% for the draft hood and 10% for the standing pilot. And, you know, got an old uninsulated cabinet and you're losing heat in the basement. So that appliance that you know is measuring 81% combustion efficiency is actually only 50%, 56% AFUE, right? Because it's it's losing all of its heat energy um, through standby losses. The off the draft hood that's continually drafting, the pilot that's burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, all summer long, 
Uh, there's no advantage to a standing pilot. They don't keep the furnace dry. You know, people have said stuff like that. The, the standing pilot doesn't provide you with any value except for lighting the gas on there. And it was, a, it was an old school way of doing it. And it was a standby loss. So when you look at, you know, this, this old furnace in the basement, it, that's run about 56% efficient versus a 97.8% AFU replacement, you can actually achieve a 41% increase in efficiency. And that, that's, that's substantial. So if you're talking a, a $1,600 annual fuel gas bill, you know, somebody's gonna see an approximate savings of uh, $656 a year. And if you're talking uh, $3,500, let's say for a new furnace, um, just the furnace itself, you're talking about a 5.3 year payback at uh, current natural gas rates. I mean, it's, it's these older appliances, even though you can make them run well and, and um, uh, they'll have decent comp combustion efficiency, you got to remember the other standby losses. And sometimes it's just you're far better ahead just to uh, upgrade these appliances to higher efficiency models because they're, they've gotten so much better uh, today. The, uh, when we get into the 80% efficient appliance, again, we got the adjustable fuel pressure, 3.2 to 3.8. Oops, sorry, I went ahead of screen there. Excess air now, it's gonna be maybe a little bit better controlled at 25 to 75% excess air. Typically, we'll see these run right in that, um, in that 50% excess air range. CO again, below 100 parts per million. Stack temperature is gonna drop down a little bit now because you know heat energy either goes two places on a furnace. It either goes in the house or up the stack. So because we've slowed, we, we've, we've increased the blower speed now, and we've gotten away from that 100 degree rise. Now we're talking temperature rise, that's maybe 40 to 70 degrees. And that combustion efficiency is around 80%, at a 78 to 82% range. And we typically don't wanna see combustion efficiencies over 82% because that can lead to condensing in the, in the stack. Uh, and again, you know, we gotta make sure that we're getting the, the input correct in the appliance, because if you, if you don't have that input correct, uh, you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna you're gonna cause yourself some problems on there, and all this again is outlined in the combustion guide. You can download free uh, from AccuTools and um, you know walk you through all those steps. But 80% uh, efficient furnace, a little bit better controlled. Now we get into 90%, and again you'll see that um, again allowable 3.2 to 3.8 in, inches of water column. Uh, excess air reading again more tightly controlled. I've seen these down as low as 25% excess air. Uh, O2 readings now dropping down between 4.2 and 9%. Again, CO below 100. And now we get that stack temperature is between 80 and 120 degrees. Um, we don't want to go above 120 degree stack temperature with the one caveat being that's typically at a 70 degree return air temp. Um, as a return air temperature goes up, if you're testing a home like a new construction and it's 80 degrees outside, you're going to have higher than 120 degree stack temperature because Again, the return air temperature adds to the stack temperature. So uh, when it, we're running under typical conditions, you know, 70 degrees or below outdoors, we don't want to see that stack temperature over 120 degrees. And then uh, combustion efficiencies are anywhere from 89 to 98.5%. Now, in that 89 range, you will see almost no condensate coming out of that appliance. All right, and, and you get up in the 98.5 range, it'll be pouring condensate out of that appliance. These are furnaces that capture the latent heat out of the flue gas. They take the, uh, the moisture and condense it, uh, water vapor and condense it into water. And in that, in that we get about 970 BTUs of additional heat energy of, of, uh, the per pound of water that we condense. So when you get onto a, these newer furnaces and they're showing you know, the high efficiency, you know, 90, 90 plus percent efficiency and you don't see condensate coming out, that's also a good indicator that that, that furnace is underfired. Underfiring a gas appliance will produce high excess air readings. Remember the, the induced draft motor, it's at a fixed speed. It, it really doesn't care. It's gonna pull a constant CFM independent of what's going into it. So the only way we control the secondary air going into that burner is by, by adjusting the input and getting the fuel input correct. So I can't overstress the amount of how important it is to get that input correct on the gas appliance to make it operate the way it's engineered to. And that again, goes back to clocking the meter. Now I had a, I have a 94% efficient furnace in my house and straight from the factory, I had to change the orifices because it was under fired that much. In fact, it's 90,000 BTU input. And I believe it was running around 78,000 BTUs from the factory. And once I got that input correct, that thing ran like a top and also, um, because I have my input correct, I have my temperature rise correct, I can also guarantee you I have eliminated a plethora of problems that you will see otherwise. So 
When you don't have in input correct, you don't have temperature rise correct on a furnace, that's where we see heat exchanger failures, that's where we see corrosion, that's where we see stacks rotting out, that's where we see um, cracks and, and things in a heat exchanger. So, you know, wedding rings popping off and it's almost always in, input and airflow related. I, I would say almost 100% of the time. And it just comes down to people not taking the time to properly set up the appliance once. And once we get the input set correctly one time, we typically do not have to adjust it. Heat content remains fairly constant year to year on our, uh, on our fuels. And you know we can go and look at the heat content every year on the EIA website, and uh, it'll allow us to, uh, to set that up as we wanna do that. Differential temperature testing. Again, uh, Blue Flame's got that built in. So we can get the T2 temperature, the supply air temp, return air temp, and very easily get the differential temperature uh, on that appliance with a couple of K-type thermocouples in the analyzer. So again, you know, I'm not going pulling a bunch of different tools out of my tool bag. I can do everything I need to do with the analyzer on there uh, real quick. Did want to cover combustion testing on uh, some, some boilers and things like that too. Um, again, boilers uh, typically have a draft hood. You might see some really, really old stuff out there that does not have a draft hood equipped on there. And in those cases, uh, you might want to install a what's called a, a double acting or single acting barometric damper, depending on whether you have uh, gas or oil. Gas is a double acting, oil is a single acting barometric damper. But the draft hood, again, separates the appliance from the gas and, and makes the appliance, the combustion, very, very stable. And uh, just like a gas furnace, we need to make sure that we have correct input. And uh, a lot of times on boilers, you have to, you know, periodically pull off what's called the uh, the bonnet on the top and uh, and clean between the cells, brush between the cells because that the deposits of rust and gas on there, those will slow down or, or, or excess air. And when you have high CO on a boiler, typically it needs cleaned. That's a very typical problem. We wanna see, uh, you know, about a 20 degree uh, temperature rise on the, on the water uh, going through a boiler when it's set up. It's very, very, very typical, but follow manufacturer's directions on there. Again, about the same study state efficiencies. One thing I will tell you, uh, when you start up a cold boiler and it's full of uh, you know, cold water, you know, it's the first time you start it for the year, a little bit of condensation dripping down on the burners is normal. You'll see the same thing with a brand new hot water tank you put in. A lot of times it's not leaking. It's, you know, in fact, 99% of the time it's not leaking. It's just condensation because the water's cold. And once the water gets warmed up, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna you know, um, stop stop condensing and, uh, and it'll run fine. So you really, when you're testing a boiler, you're testing a furnace, you have to give it time to warm up. You know, typically we're waiting, you know, uh, five to 15, 20 minutes on a, on a boiler to get that thing, uh, you know, where the water's starting to heat up before we do a combustion test, because it's, it's really not um, gonna show you good numbers until it's, it's warmed up and running right. So uh, on a non-condensing boiler, we wanna see that return air water, uh, a, uh, at 140 degrees minimum to avoid condensing. And um, so sort of important there. And, you know, typically if, uh, if you have it below 140, you just don't have enough flow. Maybe your circulator is not uh, pumping right. So, you know, 20 degrees, again, really important on that to make sure we're checking the rise on that. We get into a condensing boiler or a 80 plus boiler. Again, this is an 80 plus typical hot water boiler. Uh, again, we're gonna wanna watch that return air temperature. Seen a ton of lock of our boilers there the bottoms of them will rot out if you do not have the uh, if you do not have the water uh, split correct. So you really, really pay close attention on boilers to return air water temperature. Very, very important um, to make sure that we don't get condensing in places that we shouldn't be condensing on there. Draft test um, uh, anywhere from 12 to 18 inches above the uh, induced draft motor. You do not want to be right on top of that draft inducer motor when you're um, when you're when you're making your draft measurement because there is a uh, what's called a static regain um, when the when the air comes off the tip of the induced motor it's coming off very very quickly and you want to make sure you're far enough away that the that the draft pressure's had time to stabilize even though that motor's exhausting into the stack where we're, the draft is drawing harder than the motor can blow into the stack so again the pressures will be negative in that uh, in that appliance on there um, we get into seal combustion boiler Right, so now we get into condensing boiler. Um, again, uh, we're gonna control the uh, excess air a lot more tightly. So we're gonna see that 4.2 to 9% excess air. 
Again, stack temperature should be below 120 degrees um, on there. We wanna make sure that uh, we're not uh, overheating that PVC venting in there. Um, Canada, you gotta be careful. You guys have a, a different uh, venting requirements as far as the materials that are used, but um, uh, so, so make sure that we're paying, paying close attention to the stack temperatures on there and paying very close attention, again, ten, attention to the temperature rise across the boiler. Uh, K-type thermocouple clamps can be used or you can use B-type thermocouples with your blue flame analyzer, differential temperature across the boiler. It's really the only tool you really need to get this thing set up properly. A uh, couple things on oil on there. Oil appliances, um, they have, you notice I changed the color down here, the flame to a, uh, a straw colored or a yellow colored flame because oil appliances have what's called a carbon luminous flame. Um, the, uh, some of the fuel oil, it, it does what's called uh, cracking. And um, the, it's just like uh, when we uh, uh, refine oil, where we, where we uh, heat it up and um, the, the finer oil uh, goes to the edge of the flame and, and then it actually burns there. That orange or silver you know, gold color flame is completely normal. That's a carbon luminous flame. It transfers about six times more heat energy by radiation than by, that a blue flame does. Um, just like if you lit off your oxacetylene torch and you light that acetylene, that bright yellow flame, how much heat it puts off. And then when you, when you put on the oxygen, you know the flame's hotter. It's, it's the way hotter flame, but you don't feel the radi heat energy as much. And that's because the, the color of the flame determines how it's gonna transfer its energy. Now we're in a larger combustion chamber, so we need more heat energy by radiation. Um, you know, we have to make sure that uh, now we have an appliance that's physically connected to the draft. And there is no draft hood on an oil appliance. And we have a draft regulator, you can see up here, and the draft regulator's job is to maintain constant draft down below. So we wanna make sure that we have enough draft at the, uh, over the fire, right? To, so we still have enough suction here, about negative 0.02, um, so that we're pulling all the flue gases through the primary heat exchanger and up the stack. So we wanna make sure we check draft two locations over the fire and draft at the, uh, below the uh, barometric damper here. There's a little red piece here. This is a double acting barometric, so it, it can't swing both directions, or so, sorry, single acting barometric. And uh, we wanna make sure that when we set the draft here at the chimney, it's between negative 0.02 to 0.04. Now, fuel pressure on an appliance, it's a nominal 100 pounds. And you, and, and you may find, you have to look at how the manufacturer designed the furnace, the fuel, the, the fuel pressure could be anywhere from 100 to 150 pounds. And the nozzle size, uh, again, nozzles are rated at nominal gallons per hour, but typically uh, 100 PSI is what a nozzle is rated at. As you increase or decrease the fuel pressure, you change the flow of the nozzle. And uh, that, um, if you look in your, uh, your, your burner guides, like uh, Beckett publishes their AFG guide, they'll tell you what, every nozzle, what fuel pressure, what it'll output. And again, it's a mathematical calculation we'll, we'll be putting into measure quick on there. Um, these appliances can operate very, very efficiently. Um, and you can actually have these operate in the, in the 80 plus range pretty easily. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're looking at uh, several things. Again, we wanna make sure our stack temperature is in a safe range of 400 to 600 degrees. Temperature rise is right, efficiency is right. And more importantly than anything, we wanna make sure that we have the input correct and the draft correct. Because on these furnaces, uh, a low input, if, you, if you're not providing that furnace with enough fuel oil um, and the fire is smaller than it should be, we're not gonna get that great radiant heat transfer and, they, and they, the efficiency is gonna go down. And the smoke spot number, when we talk about tobacco, smoke, smoke spot should be a true zero. Um, all burners should not produce any, any um, uh, smoke at all. So you always want to achieve a true zero on your smoke spot number on there. We get into the, um, uh, you know, what we we're looking at first here was just the cast iron cone burner head. So that's why we get that, that 73 to 79% efficient. We get into the uh, retention, home, retention head burners. Now we can get into that 78 to 84% gross efficiency range because now we're getting a better mixture of, of fuel and gas. It's just a the way the burner's designed, the head's a little more efficient and you're gonna get a, a much better uh, uh, mix of fuel and gas oil on there. And some oil appliances, they do get into the uh, condensing. Um, we actually have a company here in Cleveland that makes condensing oil appliances and they have a, uh, a secondary heat exchanger in there and that secondary heat exchanger is gonna extract additional heat out of the flue gases. 
And oil can work just as good as gas can um, when it comes to condensing appliances. It's just, they're expensive. They're more expensive because oh, I think oil makes about 15% of our market up out here. So it's not a huge market for oil out there, but they do have high efficiency um, oil appliances and they can run again, zero parts per million CO and they can run condensing just like we do with gas and they can run efficiencies up to 98 and a half percent efficiency on the oil side. So, you know, as you're thinking about um, tuning up that really old oil furnace out there, don't forget, you know, you could honestly take somebody that's uh, running an appliance that's, you know, 60, 70 percent efficient up to 98 and a half percent efficient range. And at the cost of fuel oil, uh, those are things that are really, really worth looking at. And again, zero smoke, uh, you gotta be really, really close attention to smoke on a, on a condensing appliance because uh, the, the, the secondary heat exchanger designs are very complex and you don't wanna, you don't wanna clog that up with soot and smoke and uh, unburned oil. Uh, hot water tanks, I, I cannot stress enough, you should be always testing hot water tanks. In this case, this is my house, uh, my hot water tank's not connected to my, um, my furnace because it's not common vented, but hot water tanks can be, can be a, uh, a significant source of CO. We're using a blue flame analyzer here with a, an iPad. The app's really slick because it can start and stop the, uh, the analyzer, so it makes it really easy for testing. Uh, but I'm down inside the combustion chamber, and so you can see on a hot water tank here, um, you know, again, we want to, the draft hood separates the appliance from the draft, we want to test, there's what's called a turbulator going up the center of this. And, and so when the gas is burning down here, we want to slow those flue gases down. And so it just goes through a, like a, a twisted piece of metal to slow the flue gases down to get the maximum amount of heat transfer by convection. And so we want to test on both sides of that because a burner can be burning differently over here than over here. And what will happen is um, uh, you may miss high CO on a burner and again, test spillage all the way around the draft hood because it may be spilling on one side and not the other. This is the important reason that appliances need to be level. Um, if they're not level, then they then they could spill out of one side or the other of the draft hood. Um, you know, here's the typical readings for those. And again, all these are available in the, in the combustion guide. Um, commercial boilers, I know we're coming up on an hour here, but uh, I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, com com commercial boilers because a blue flame analyzer is really uh, it's a it's a very very good analyzer. It's got a uh, uh, a CO cell that will uh, take uh, intermittent shots of uh, up to 20,000 parts per million of CO. It's uh, rated at 10,000 parts per million CO. It's got um, sensors in there that are commercial, I guess, rated as what I'm getting at right here. So you can use your blue flame analyzer to do uh, even um, large gas appliances. This is a, a, a two pass wet back boiler. Wet back meaning that there's water on the back of the combustion chamber. And, um, you know, it can, uh, again, a barometric damper, in this case, a double acting barometric damper because we're controlling draft of the appliance. Fuel pressure on these, a lot of times the manufacturer recommended because it's, um, they're not a nominal three and a half inches of water column like a residential appliance is. Um, you know, excess air, we want to really carefully control that. If we're talking about uh, process equipment um, used for manufacturing and things like that, like steam, like we might use for manufacturing hot water for you know, drying or curing something, we'll actually want to do a summer and a winter tuning because the air density changes so much from summer to winter that we want to actually, you know, uh, tightly control that excess air in the summer and tightly control that excess air in the winter. And uh, we do that with air shutters on the burner and then, you know, obviously getting the input correct on the appliance on there. Um, and all the readings, uh, you know, typical 325 to 450 stack temperature, um, very, very typical to uh, residential appliances. It's just what we're trying to do is, is control that um, stack temperature a lot tighter on there. And um, that is not a, a flame retention oil burner, by the way. That's a mistake in my PowerPoint slide. I left this piece there. Three pass wet boilers. So again, you know, that now we get into, the boilers are typically one, two or three pass. And uh, the higher efficiency of the boiler, the more passes we get through there to get the additional uh, heat out of the flue gases. Um, you're going to see lower stack temperatures on a three pass than you will a two pass. And uh, typically these are larger appliances. We want to follow the manufacturer's uh, directions on setup implicitly and how those are done. But um, these types of appliances can immensely benefit from uh, being set up properly because they're using huge amounts of fuel. So, you know, the larger the appliance is, the more that we're going to benefit from proper input and proper setup in the appliance. And so I guess don't overlook that when you're talking about savings. 
Last thing I want to talk about is just worst case draft testing and pressure testing. Again, um, combustion analyzer is perfect for that. What I'm doing here is I'm measuring draft in my stack. And uh, what we're trying to do here is we're, we're making sure that my combustion air zone with reference to outside is not going too negative. And what I'm trying to avoid here is um, the combustion being affected by pressures in the house. So in this case down here, I've got, a, I'm showing a return air duct leak, right? So we're sucking return air at negative six pascals. It's pulling the combustion air zone negative with respect to outside. And that's enough pressure that it's sucking the flue gases backwards down the stack and causing spillage. And then that spillage is gonna leak right over here into that duct leak and we're gonna circulate that spillage throughout the house. And if we're making carbon monoxide, this could be a serious problem for that, for that burner. And we're, we're robbing that burner uh, because we're, we're putting flue gases in the room, right? We're replacing um, clean air with oxygen deprived air. And now we have a recipe for making carbon monoxide in there because we're, we're spilling um, gases in the room that are, have less oxygen in, in them than they would get from outside. So, you know, very, very important. Um, and the combustion analyzer has a, uh, has a very, very uh, high resolution draft gauge we can use to test combustion air zone pressures. Um, a lot of guys use a blower door gauge for this because it even has higher resolution on it. Uh, but uh, uh, combustion air zone testing is a very, very important part and that's completely outlined in the, in the combustion guide uh, available from AccuTools. Um, a couple other things here, here's the last slide here. Uh, if you have any questions about the presentation, uh, you can email me at jim at measurequick.com. Uh, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Blows a cell phone number if you need to call me and talk to, about anything on here. Um, and then I have one slide after this. I'll give it just a second. And um, uh, Bill has a um, uh, gift card. You can earn a $20 gift card from True Tech Tools by taking a 15-minute survey. Uh, this is for students at the University of Pittsburgh School of Business Management. And I'd like to get some opinions on uh, True Tech tools and uh, services and the uh, products that they provide. So there's, uh, if you want to sign up for a call time, uh, there's two links. There's a survey period there. Uh, you can just jot down those uh, two links, and that survey period ends November the fifth. Um, and then, uh, Thank Bill, you, was there any questions? Uh, no further questions have come in. I did share with everyone in the chat. I created a, sh a short link. For the combustion guide that goes to the EcuTool site. So, uh, for those of you listening, um, it's or if you listen afterwards the recording, it's bitly, bit dot ly forward slash combustion guide. That's all one word, but an uppercase C and an uppercase G. So, bit dot ly forward slash combustion guide. Uppercase C, uppercase G. And this is what Jim is showing on the screen right now. I'll call it a quick start guide to combustion, but it's really more than quick. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, I think we did get one question come in. Yeah, right here. Let me uh, open the chat pane here. How critical is draft pressure measurement on gas pack units? On on draft dr draft draft is critical on on any unit. I mean, uh, the interesting thing with a draft hood is it separates the appliance from the draft. So Excessive draft um, will just cause excessive standby losses, and um, you know, so excessive draft is is a is an issue. You could control it with a with a uh, with a barometric damper, um, but many many appliance many appliance manufacturers do not want their appliance modified uh, in elimination of the draft hood. So um, that that you have to you you really should not eliminate a draft hood without permission from the appliance manufacturer to do so. Uh, excessive draft, and we've done some uh, videos on this. Um, they're on the True Tech Tools uh, video page. We actually show what happens with a low draft to very, very high draft, I think up to 10 times the allowable draft on the draft hood, and that it does not affect the combustion of the appliance because the draft hood physically separates the appliance from it. But what you will get is excessive stack draft, uh, ex excessive losses. Now, that said, low draft is a is of a huge concern, and uh, any appliance that doesn't have you know that that allowable draft negative 0.02 to 0.04 and then again there's a formula here uh on the combustion guide um, where we can actually calculate the draft in pascals at any outdoor air temperature because draft does vary with the outdoor air temperature the hotter it is outside the lower the draft goes 
Well, we want to make sure that we have enough draft to always exhaust the flue gases out. So it doesn't matter all, either, you know, whether that appliance is, um, uh, what, what type of appliance it is, draft is uh, very critical for proper um, removal of the exhaust gases from the space. It doesn't affect the, uh, the appliance unless it's connected physically, like an oil burner is connected to the draft. So the draft plays a huge role in the amount of secondary air that is introduced to the combustion chamber. When you have a draft hood and it's connected to the appliance, it separates the appliance from the draft. So now the, the, the natural rising of the flue gases is what controls the gases through a, uh, a draft hood equipped appliance where appliance connected to the draft, the draft becomes uh, very, very critical, so. Very good. Um, that was the last question we had right now. Um, and for those that are listening, we will publish this as a YouTube video, um, probably by this afternoon. So if anybody you know who missed it, uh, they can come back and come back around and watch it too. Anything All else right. in closing, Jim? No. Uh, again, check out the uh, the Blue Flame Combustion Analyzer. It's a, a really really solid tool. We've been uh, we've been doing a lot of work with it, getting it ready for the uh, Measure Quick application. It will be streaming data in live to Measure Quick, so it's going to be really slick. We'll be able to do a lot of things with the trending and visualization of the data and um, uh, it's going to be the uh, the only analyzer currently that, that streams data in. We will be doing the uh, back rack QR codes and bringing data in for the combustion test reports, and uh, I'm sure we'll be doing some work down the road with Testo on the combustion side uh, on the uh, Measure Quick application. But right now, the, um, the, the probably the big differentiator between the Acu Tools uh, combustion analyzer is it's got a really really solid standalone application uh, that. Um, that AccuTools has with the combustion analyzer, but it will be the first product uh, on the combustion side to actually stream data into Measure Quick, and that's for us probably the more exciting part um, because um, we'll be able to do a lot on the diagnostic sides that we haven't been able to do um, you know, classically with uh, these types of products. So um, check that check that out. I think you'd be very very pleased with it. It's a a very uh, high end product. And um, so far, we've got nothing but great uh, feedback from people in the field that have purchased one. And you can get them at True Tech Tools. <laughs> All right. I'd be Thank remiss not to mention that. You're welcome, Jim. And thank everyone for listening and watching today. And uh, we appreciate uh, your feedback at any time. Thank you for, um, for presenting this, Jim. We really appreciate it. Yep, no problem. All right. Have a good day, Bill. Okay. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye-bye.